Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Orphan, released in 2009. Orphan is an evil kid movie, in the vein of The Omen and The Bad Seed. It's also straight up ridiculous, and has to be seen to be believed. Seriously, this is one you'll want to watch before The Kill Count. Although it is full of sensitive topics that it barrels through on its way to shock and thrill you. Alcoholism, marital strife, stillborn children, hearing impairments, all of this and more are thrown into a blend to whip up a campy horror movie. And by God, I think it works. Orphan was co-produced by Dark Castle Entertainment, the company behind early aughts horror films like Ghost Ship and the 13 Ghosts remake. They also produced the remake of House of Wax, which was directed by Orphan's director, Jauma Collette Sarah. He and screenwriter David Leslie Johnson McGoldrick, who would go on to write the Conjuring sequels and the Aquaman movies? Okay. Employed common horror cliches all over this thing to distract the audience from figuring out what exactly is wrong with Esther. Again, if you don't know anything about this movie, please go watch it right now. I envy your position. Because it's truly an honor to meet Esther, an all-time excellent horror villain. She's played by the then 12-year-old Isabel Furman, who I can't stress enough is absolutely incredible in the role. It's one of the best kid acting performances I've ever seen. She's so good as the character that I'm thrilled she gets to do it again in the upcoming prequel, Orphan First Kill, which releases to some theaters and Paramount Plus in one week, Friday, August 19th. Sure, Furman was 23 when they filmed First Kill, which is somehow supposed to take place before this movie, but whatever man, I'll take it. I'm especially interested since the filmmakers have said they didn't use CGI to de-age her, instead apparently relying on makeup and forced perspective shots. Now, for me, when it comes to de-aging, I'm more a fan of proper body maintenance, and I couldn't do that without the help of today's sponsor, Manscaped. That's right, maintaining peak James doesn't just mean pumping the old iron or feeding myself only the finest nutritional foods. It also means taking care of all my little follicle bros. Folla bros! Fist bump! Hell yeah, guys. Ow. That's why I love that Manscaped has their new Platinum Package 4.0 to ensure that all of us have the ultimate grooming kit. Whether you prefer your hair au naturel, trimmed and styled, or smooth and shaved. And what comes in the kit? Well, let's go through it, motherfuckers! We've got body wash. We've got two-in-one shampoo and conditioner. We've got the Lawn Mower 4.0 trimmer and Weed Whacker nose hair trimmer. And they're both waterproof, so you can get that cutting and cleaning done all at once. Then step out of the shower and we've got underarm deodorant and ball deodorant. Yeah, ball deodorant's a thing. Did you forget the ball deodorant? Well, been freshen up with ball toner spray. I've just said balls so many times. <laughs> but it's worth it, because after all that, people will just have to let you know that I smell good. Go to manscaped.com today to get 20% off and two free gifts when you use the promo code KILLCOUNT20. That's promo code KILLCOUNT20 at manscaped.com for 20% off and two free gifts. Let's see how many people about to have a hard knock end of life and get to the kills. The movie begins with a blinky blacklight title card! Our main couple, Kate and John Coleman, enter a hospital looking like a Claritin commercial. Kate's in labor with the couple's third child until a bloody wheelchair ride denotes the worst thing possible. I'm so sorry for your loss. What? Your baby's dead. Turns out this glossy experience is a nightmare that Kate's been having ever since the stillbirth of their would-be third child, whom they were going to name Jessica. The traumatic event led to a period of alcoholism for Kate, and though she's been sober lately, she still lost her job teaching music at Yale. That's okay, though. John provides a good income as an architect. Or maybe that tube on his back is so he can resell Comic-Con exclusive Mondo drops. Either way, they can afford to live in this gorgeous home in what I think is meant to be Hamden, Connecticut. That's based on the license plates and a few other hints, although the movie was filmed in Montreal. The Colemans have two biological children. 12-year-old Daniel's a rambunctious little shitbird. 5-year-old Max is partially deaf, can read lips, and sleeps in a bed covered in popcorn balls. I think the cast does a great job acting like a real family, especially the seasoned performers playing the parents. Vera Farmiga is probably best known to people like us for the Conjuring series, while Peter Sarsgaard was recently seen in The Batman, which is not a horror movie. At first, Kate and John seem like a happy, loving couple. He's so good. Hell, he even worms his wood into her in the kitchen. They are so damn horny for each other, which, you know, I get. Later on, though, we see that their horniness is just a band-aid over deeper set issues. Spoiler alert, John kinda sucks. Jessica's stillbirth weighs heavily on the family. Max even has a children's book to help her understand. I 
I can't speak to how accurate Farmiga's sign language is here, but she does a great job conveying her grief and giving us context as to why this couple needs to adopt another child. I just don't want you to feel like we have to go through with this for my sake. It's not just... It's not for you. I... I... I'm gonna take the love that we felt for Jessica and I wanna give it to somebody who really needs it. The next day, the couple makes a snowy drive out to St. Mariana's Home for Girls, an orphanage headed by Sister Abigail, who leads them inside as someone watches from the attic. Billy, is that you? Billy! Or maybe it's just a cam op waiting to be adopted. While Kate observes some children being terrorized by a fucking hideous clown, what the fuck? John wanders up to the second floor to admire orphan artwork. Ah yes, big egg over barbed wire. That bird's cloaca must be aching. He's lured into a classroom by the sound of singing and discovers its source as this pint-sized Picasso. This is Esther, played by Isabel Furman, who would go on to appear in The Hunger Games and disappear from Escape Room Tournament of Champions. This movie pretty much lives or dies by this 12-year-old's performance. And thankfully, she does an amazing job, all while doing a vaguely Eastern European accent. My paintings always tell stories. This one's about the sad mother lion who can't find her cubs. Furman had a dialect coach to teach her this Estonian accent. And again, I can't stress how much this movie succeeds based mostly on her startlingly mature performance. You always gotta remember though that great kid actors are still just kids. I loved seeing her seem like a kid, a smart one, discussing the role in interviews. She was such a complex character and I don't know, something about her just drew me to her and I thought she would be such a challenging character to play and be a lot of fun. Kate catches up with her husband, who's been admiring Esther's Seaman fan art, and their immediate connection with the orphan is noticed by Sister Abigail. She explains that Esther's originally from Russia. The family that brought her to the US died in a mysterious house fire. Despite that, Esther's been relatively well adjusted. She's a bit of a princess, actually. She wears those ribbons on her wrists and her neck all the time. The only time we've ever had trouble with her is when we've tried to take them off. Yo, I've read the green ribbon, that girl's head gonna fall off! The couple decides to adopt Esther, and three weeks later, she goes home with them to meet her new family. She quickly bonds with Max through sign language, but Daniel isn't a fan of hers after she interrupts his Aperol spritz time. Why does she dress like that? Oh, come on. Stop it. Give it 10 years, kid. That outfit will be called Cottage Core. Esther will have a TikTok with haul videos from vintage stores. Her handle will be at Aesthetic. Daniel doesn't like that he's no longer the center of attention, but maybe if he wants respect, he should play on Expert. Come on, kid. Surrender is a tier one song. I bet Esther 100%'s Freebird on the rigs. A few days later, while paintballing in the woods, Daniel decides to stop shooting soldiers and start shooting messengers. This pigeon ain't made of clay, though, and he quickly regrets his decision, Bart Simpson style. Esther shows up with Max in tow and turns this into a teachable moment. Put it out of its misery. It's in pain. And it's your responsibility. Daniel refuses, so Esther asserts her dominance and does the deed for him. Strangely ruthless reaction for this little girl to have. Also strange, the old Bible Kate finds while cleaning Esther's room. There's a picture of a man inside. Is that Matthew, Mark, or Luke? I know it's not John. He looks way different. At school the next day, our little James T. Jerk bullies Esther by knocking that Bible out of her arms. Wait, that is a Bible, right? Is this a Bible? Asking the real questions, miniature mean girl. This is Brenda, and she's been bullying Esther since day one. Oh look, little Bo Peep texts me. She wants her outfit back. <laughs> Talking shit in school? That's a Paddington. Brenda continues to pester Esther by turning her good book into confetti, but she goes too far when she tries to take off the neck ribbon. It causes this Baudelaire to go ballistic like she just watched a pancake milkshake bunny explode. Esther calms down in time for a piano lesson with Kate, something she expressed interest in when she first arrived. You have a piano? Yeah. <laughs> you like to learn how to play? I would love to. I was not surprised to learn that Vera Farmiga is a classically trained pianist. The shots of her playing are way too impressive for her to have faked them. When Kate tries to bring up Esther's issues at school, Esther changes the subject by asking about baby Jessica, whose name she learned from Max. In response, Kate shows her Jessica's memorial in their greenhouse. But we scattered her ashes here. As long as this plant grows, then... Part of her will be alive inside it. Living black girl. John takes the girls on a playground outing where he's hit on by his neighbor Joyce. But even though this racy mom has got it going on, John remains faithful and deflects her advances. All that MILF guarding leads to a smoke break, giving militant Matilda the opening to slip away. She stalks mean girl Brendina George, whom she spots on her lonesome wearing pink. Must be a Wednesday. After a very drawn out horror sequence, complete with creaky floorboards and fake out jump scares, Esther pushes Brenda from the top 
top of the playscape, breaking her ankle upon impact. Max sees the whole thing go down, but refuses to sell out her sister at the dinner table. And did you see what happened? Maybe she's just looking out, because without Esther, she'd never get to eat. What? Mom, what's she saying? She wants you to pass the bread and butter. Wasn't asking you. Well, we were asking you to learn ASL for your deaf sister, you whiny little shit. Daniel's had enough of Esther and calls her the R word, which earns him a padlock punishment. His treehouse hangout is closed for now, meaning he can't get to his porno mag or Fear Street costume. Did not expect Orphan to be a movie that technically has boobs in it. Whoa. <laughs> Kate is unsure of Esther's innocence at the playground, and her suspicions are further roused when she finds her playing piano like a prodigy, revealing that she's not the fledgling player she pretended to be. John shrugs it off, which will become a habit for him, and their argument opens old wounds about a time when John cheated on her. It's been like 10 years. What does it mean, it's been 10 years? You say that like it, it actually means something. It's only been two years since you told me. In turn, John references something that happened to Max when Kate had a drinking problem. The spousal argument brings a smile to Esther's face. Yep, things are going smoothly for the little schemer, until they get an unconventional visit from Sister Abigail, who's here to say this movie's tagline. I think there could be something wrong with Esther. Kate had called her about the playground incident, so this captain of the barn did a little digging. After you told me about the girl in the playground, I called her old school. She called her old school, didn't text her nothing. Apparently a boy at her last school accidentally fell on some scissors, and the house fire that killed the family that brought her to the US involved foul play. It was arson. <gasps> Sabatula! An eavesdropping Esther don't like what she hears, so she runs upstairs to recruit her impressionable little sister. There's a mean lady here. She's come to take me away. Will you help me? Esther is a master manipulator, and Max is a perfect first mark. She's young and trusting, and Esther exploits her disability by pretending she cares through ASL. She employs the skills she learned from Fagin, and the Ocean nine-year-old's heist yields a nuncracker and John's keys to the office safe, inside of which there's a gun. Esther tries to export some culture with a game of Russian roulette. Do you want to play? And when that fails, demonstrates more hometown pride by making this a Chekhov's gun. Maybe later. Sister Abigail leaves, and the girls wait for her car by a bridge near their house. Esther commands Max to wave down the nun, promising they'll only scare her. When Max hesitates, the good Russ son treats her like Mr. Highway and shoves her in front of the sister's speeding car. Luckily, this mother's superior driving narrowly avoids Max, but when she gets out to see what's happened, she's met with a certified Aunt Maggie special. Try not to leave any good guy's shoe prints in the snow. Abigail is still for a second, but her apparent death is just a sister act. Esther gets back in the habit of murder and kills Abigail. Abigail by CCH pounding her head repeatedly. That is a seriously bad influence on Max. Orphan is the film debut for Max's deaf actress, Ariana Engineer. She later represented Canada with her brother at the opening ceremony of the 2010 Winter Paralympics. Esther hides the bloody clothes and hammer in the treehouse and threatens Max to keep her mouth shut. I had to kill her because she was going to tell on me. You're not going to tell on me, are you? She spots Daniel watching them as they walk back to the house, so she gives him a similar treatment that night. If I find out that you're lying, I'll cut your hairless little prick off before you even figure out what it's for. By this point, Esther has cemented herself as one of my favorite bizarre little horror villains, and we're only halfway through the film. Esther's recent behavior lands her an appointment with Dr. Browning, played by character actress Margot Martindale, a U of M grad. Go blue! Dr. Browning is Kate's therapist, whom she talks to about her struggles with sobriety. I'm not sure why Esther isn't being taken to, you know, a child psychologist, but I'm sure this can be justified by this lady's keen perception. There's not a deeply rooted problem in Esther's past. So there's nothing wrong with her. No. Or not. Also, what was going on through that window back there? Why is that in this movie? Esther has gotten Dr. Browning to buy into her Bojack horse shit. It's practically magic how the therapist now believes Esther's behavioral problems stem from Kate. She's really doing her best to please you, but you're blocking her attempts to bond. If only they could see Esther kicking her own ass in the bathroom, Jim Carrey style. John sides with Esther and Dr. Browning and refuses to listen to his wife. He leaves her outside as she gets a call from Sister Judith, another nun at St. Marinara's School for Pasta Girls. Judith is in a panic spiral since Sister Abigail never made it back to the orphanage. A police search of the surrounding woods turns up her body because I guess no one noticed that crashed car for however long it's been. Kate follows up with a pointed internet, internet sir. 
church, but her misgivings about Esther further alienate her from John. He invites Esther to paint in his office with him, where she not so subtly casts shade on Kate's parenting. I don't think Mommy likes me very much. Hey, that is not true. Mommy loves you. It's all right. It must be hard to love an adopted child as much as your own. In response to that awful line from Esther, adoption groups complained that this movie promoted negative stereotypes about adoption. The line was cut from the trailer, and on its DVD release, the movie starts with a pro-adoption message. Good sentiment, but man, couldn't they have picked a better font? John suggests Esther do something nice for Kate, so she accepts this call of duty and emerges from the shadows of evil with some Jessica roses. I picked these flowers just for you. Incensed by Esther ruining her memorial to Jessica, Norma takes the baits and grabs the girl. This gives her an opening for more cry wolfery, and that night, Esther sneaks into the tool shed. Using a vice grip, she breaks her own arm! God damn! Esther is hardcore! The broken bone is blamed on Kate, so John banishes her to the couch. With the fate of her family up in the air, a stressed out Kate is driven back to the bottle. Instead of imbibing, though, she steadies herself and empties one of them down the drain. The next morning at school, while Kate is helping Daniel with some books that have fallen out of his suspiciously sliced open bag, Esther sneakily releases the parking brake. The family car dangerously zooms down the parking lot, and while a snowbank cushions Max from any serious injury, it's the last straw for John, who once again blames Kate. He calls over Dr. Browning for an intervention against his good wife. Girls found this this morning. Girls found it. You mean Esther found it. Farmiga is heartbreaking here as she tells them that she wasn't drunk while dropping off the kids. The only reason that I'm sober is because of Max and Daniel. That is the only reason. I look at the pond, I think about what would have happened had you not been there. And it makes me want to kill myself. But her pleas are ignored by John, who calls her manipulative. Solidifying himself as a top 10 shitty horror husband, he gives her a week to go to rehab and says he'll take the kids away if she doesn't. Kate tries to get ahead and sneak out with the kids that night, but she's stopped by Esther, who finally drops the friendly facade. Go to your room. Honestly, we're past that now. Aren't we? She reveals that she's read Kate's journal and fills us in on the details of the pond accident. I'm not the one who passed out drunk and let Max almost drown in the pond. If it wasn't for John, she'd be dead and you'd probably still be in jail. It's partly nice that the gaslighting is over and Esther is being openly evil towards Kate, but Kate's hands are still tied due to the threat of child services. What are you going to do? Hit me? Well, she's nine, so if the dealer has a two, then probably. The next day, Kate sneaks into Esther's room to dig up some dirt. A better look at her Bible reveals an inscription in the back, the Sarn Institute. She calls their number to ask about Esther, assuming it's her previous orphanage. It is not. She has not come from here. Well, I haven't even told you her name yet. <sighs> You do not understand, Sarn Institute is not an orphanage, it is a mental hospital. Sick of how much this is no ordinary family anymore, Daniel confronts Max about Sister Abigail's death. Some incriminating crayon drawings indicate that the evidence is hidden in his treehouse. When he goes up there to check things out, Esther's waiting for him with a bottle of lighter fluid. She sets both the evidence and the treehouse ablaze, then padlocks the door again, trapping the young boy inside. He's forced to escape outside, where the flames threaten to engulf him in pixels, and after jumping onto a wooden beam, the kid falls to the ground. He's knocked out cold, and Esther prepares to take out this potential stool pigeon. But Max intervenes, stalling her long enough for Kate to come and reach them. Daniel is taken to the hospital, where he's in critical condition but still alive, much to Esther's chagrin. Who is he? Michael fucking Myers? Kate begs John to open his eyes about Esther, as the orphan slips away to take care of Daniel once and for all. She smothers him with a pillow while wearing his heart rate monitor, which avoids detection and also shows how calm she is while murdering people. Daniel actually did die here in the movie's original script, but in the final cut, there's no need for a kill graphic. We got a pulse. We got a pulse. Upon seeing her son nearly killed, Kate marches up to Esther and bitch slaps her, Maury style. Great, now John's gotta deal with another the slap. The violent outburst gets Kate sedated by the staff. Can they do that? Just drug a random woman who's not a patient or anything? Seems wrong. Kate is forced to spend the night at the hospital while her family goes home without her. John tucks the girls into bed before cracking into the other bottle of wine, unaware that Esther's giving herself a very adult makeover with Kate's clothes and makeup. Oh man, this is when the movie gets so freaking uncomfortable! Esther shows off her new look, all dressed in orphan black, but John's feeling dope sick, and although he loves smoking, turns out he's not into clothes. What are you wearing? Do you like it? Oh, jeez. Oh, Jesus is right. Esther takes advantage of her father's drunken state to get close with him. Oh my God, this is so fucking gross. I love you, Daddy. 
You too. I really love you. Seriously, what kind of intimacy coach did they have to have on set for this scene? Sure, let me take care. The way I died. Esther's attraction to John has been hinted at throughout the movie, but holy fuck is it absolutely torturous to watch play out. Her attempts to be a master of sex like her mother quickly get to be too much for John. I'm calling Sister Judith tomorrow. We're gonna have a conversation about your future in this house. Because I can't do it. I just, I can't do it anymore. Love how this jackass throws in the towel the first time Esther's behavior affects him. Even though his wife's been voicing her concerns for weeks and he's totally ignored her wishes. Back at the hospital, Kate is awoken by a call from a doctor at the Sarn Institute. He recognized the photo of Esther Kate had sent earlier. He says it's Lena Klammer, an escaped patient from Estonia. And here's the movie's big Oliver twist. She has a rare hormone disorder. It's called hypopituitarism. It causes proportional dwarfism. She only looks like a child. According to our records, Lena Klammer was born in 1976. She's 33 years old. Yep, Esther slash Lena is not a nine-year-old girl. She's 33, explaining her world-weary wisdom and attraction to John. She tricked the family here in Estonia into adopting her. When she couldn't seduce the father, she killed him and his whole family. As wild as this twist is, Lena was inspired by a real-life person. Barbara Skirlova, a 34-year-old Czech woman, was adopted by two different families while posing as a child. Details about the incident are weird, but they're out there if you want to read about it. With nothing left to lose, Lena sheds her disguise, which includes fake teeth and a taped-down chest. She also removes her ribbons, which were hiding the scars she got at the Institute from thrashing around in a straitjacket. As Kate rushes home to warn her family, John hears a commotion and checks on Esther. He finds her missing, and her room demolished with a blacklight mural left behind. Didn't realize there was much demand for Hector Hammond porn, but hey, rule 34, you know? Man, somehow these paintings are worse than what you'd normally find in a bedroom with a blacklight. The house's power goes out, and sorry, John, no YouTube video is gonna help you fix that. Probably because your house is powered by ink cartridges? He takes a flashlight upstairs to investigate, but a cash stab to the side portends the Lena formerly known as Esther. In a painful looking ordeal, Lena excessively stabs John to death. Good Good luck exploring the infinite abyss of death. Noticing that she's got another witness to tend to, Lena goes to get Chekhov's gun right as Kate straight up crashes her car through the front of the house. Holy shit. She discovers John's body, and she doesn't need to jump into the source code to figure out who this killer is. Once again, Farmiga shows that she's a grade A actor, even if this is B-movie material. John. John. Oh my god! And I don't mean the B-movie thing as an insult. I love how fucking wacky and outlandish this movie is. Kate searches for Max, but doesn't find her. Instead, she finds a bullet in her shoulder thanks to Lena, who shoots her through an upstairs window. In case you were wondering, that's five hours of makeup and prosthetics making this 12-year-old look like an adult. I wish I could find more details about this movie's makeup team, but these Instagram stories from Isabel Furman will have to suffice for now. Kate ties a tourniquet and escapes out to the roof, where she sees Max getting cornered in the greenhouse by this wicked little thing. Mama Bear don't like that, so when the bullets start flying, so does she. Ah! Ah! Oh my god, she fucking Uso splashed her. <laughs> Wait, could we see that again, but enhanced? Me With the threat seemingly neutralized, Max and an injured Kate leave to meet the cops approaching the house. But careful ladies, this is the moment when the supposedly dead killer comes back to life for one last scare. <laughs> Told ya. The fight spills out on Colden Pond, the same one where Max nearly drowned because of Kate. Can't you people learn from the past? The ice is gonna break! Lena gets some licks in, so Max grabs the gun to provide support, but she misses her shot because she is five years old. The bullet hole causes the ice to crack, plunging both women into the freezing pond. After a brief struggle, Kate emerges victorious and starts to drag herself out. Her progress is impeded by Lena trying to hitch a ride and appealing to Kate's motherly instincts. Please. Don't let me die, mommy. But Kate's done playing. She just wants to quote the ring, too. I'm not your fucking mommy! With a swift kick, Lena is sent down into the icy depths. Good night, you princess of pain, you queen of- Wait, I'm sorry, is this a reference to Jack's death in Titanic? The movie ends with the police finding Kate and Max, their orphan ordeal finally over. How many people fell victim to this family's growing pains? Let's find out and get to the- Oh, fuck, I didn't write a bit for this part! Only three people died in Orphan, a pint-sized body count for a pint-sized killer. 
The victims consisted of one man and two women, all three of whom were technically adults. Interestingly enough, we've only seen this exact kill count and gender breakdown once before, way back in The Dentist. With a runtime of 123 minutes, we had a kill on average every 41 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Esther slash Lena Clammer. Yeah, the character's 33, but what we're actually seeing is a full-grown woman kick a little girl in the face. That's fucking wild, y'all. And I don't have a doll machete for this one. The other two kills were both solid in their own right. I don't want to punish them by default. And that's it. Orphan came out in 2009, and its prequel, Orphan First Kill, will be released to some theaters and Paramount Plus next week. If there's enough interest, I'll cover it one day. But until next time, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. On the next Kill Count. Welcome to the Australian Outback, where the roos run rampant and the sky is big. Bugger off, Montana. <laughs> While you're here, grab a slab of coldies and head over to the famous Wolf Creek Crater. That's awesome. Of course, it's dangerous to go alone, so consider a tour guide like Mick Taylor. What the bloody hell are you mob doing out here? He'll entertain you with his authentic Aussie charm. Now, pigs were different. You have to get in close, you know, get the dogs onto them, and then you go in with a knife. And stories of pig murders. <laughs> Just don't quote Crocodile Dundee to him. That's not a knife. This is a knife. Or you might end up gagged, tortured, and chased through the outback. Never know where I might pop up. <laughs> Wolf Creek is relentlessly brutal. <laughs> with a villain that makes the viewer feel as helpless as the blokes and Sheila's in the movie. Hey! Have a look on your fucking face! But it's bloody effective, and the cinematography's a real beaut. Wow, that's impressive. So this week, have a piss up and watch Wolf Creek for yourself. And on Friday, tune in for the kill count only on dead meat. That's not a knife. <laughs> this is a knife. <laughs> Wolf Creek can currently be watched on the pictured streaming platforms. Demi always recommends you watch the movie for yourself before its kill count. It's the only way to have your own properly informed opinion. Kill counts are never meant to replace the experience of watching a film. Thanks a lot for watching this kill count. I always considered this movie a kill count contender, but this episode was expedited when the prequel's release date was announced. So thanks Tim for writing that first draft pretty quickly. Who had never seen Orphan, then watched it before the kill count and was surprised by the twist? Let me know in the comments, I'm curious to see. I want to thank some patrons like Seabass123, Zachary, Brad Skanecki, Kyle Simpson, Johnny Boy, Paul Wilcoxon, and Vivian Mason. Thanks everyone, be good people.